My name's David Limbrick, for those of you that don't know me. And firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for coming along this evening. We have uh, uh, many experts that you'll hear from tonight. Um, we'll also have uh, interested parties, family members, uh, members of parliament, um, and people who've been uh, affected by what's going on. Uh, in particular, I'd also like to thank um, some of the uh, MPs that have turned up here tonight. Um, uh, Renee Heath, Bev MacArthur, Joe McCracken, Bill Tilley, Moira Deeming, Chris Kruver, Jeff Foreman, Ricky Lee Tyrrell, Anne-Marie Hermans, and Richard Reardon. Thank you so much for turning up. Um, we're talking about a policy area that um, I wasn't really, I didn't really pay much attention to it before I got elected to parliament. And like many people, just didn't really, didn't really affect me. And I was sort of drawn into this during some bills that went through in the last term of parliament, uh, biggest of which was the, the change and suppression bill that went through in the last term of parliament. And that forced me to look harder at uh, what was going on. And our team consulted with many, many different people. And we came to the conclusion that um, we had concerns and there was problems. And I discovered also that I wasn't alone. And I think many people in this room and many people in, in Victoria and indeed around the world ha are starting to ask questions about some of the things that are going on at the moment. And they're finding it very difficult to talk to each other because they get shouted down, they get called names. They're finding it very difficult to meet each other and they're finding it very difficult to become really educated about these issues and hear alternative points of view. And that's exactly why um, we've organized this tonight so that people can meet each other, so that we can uh, hear different points of view and meet people who've been affected by all this. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to um, a, a person who will be uh, emceeing the event this evening, um, wonderful Dr. Maylene Dory. Hello and welcome everyone for braving the rain and coming out um, on this Tuesday evening. And thank you, David, for that warm welcome. Um, good evening and I guess thank you, distinguished members of parliament, detransitioners, fellow clinicians, intrepid members of the journalistic community, family um, and community at large for joining us for this seminal event, the Child Safeguarding and Consent Forum. You got me? Um, at the Parliament of Victoria. Uh, before I proceed, a few little housekeeping things. Now, this evening's discussion is the byproduct of painstaking consultation. Um, it's recognised that the content is emotive, is potentially triggering, and um, you know, we appreciate that not everyone might agree with every point that's put forward. That said, on behalf of all the presenters, some who've travelled a great distance. Um, I want to official, uh, issue an official content note about the discussions that are going to follow. Um, that said, we, we really do insist that the tone at all times remains in service of the agenda that we're all collectively here to serve. Um, provisions being made for anyone that feels overwhelmed at any point to step out. There are refreshments, plenty of water, cups of tea. So please do so if you feel like you need to. Um, we also naturally ask you to turn off your phones. And finally, we have a lot of content to get through. So we'll take a few questions from the floor right at the end. Um, now, just to orient you a little bit to, um, you know, why I'm here. I'm a University of Melbourne trained medical doctor who's really passionate about mainstreaming ideas from the world of health and wellbeing. I'm also someone that believes in the fundamental right of all humans to experience belonging, um, love and acceptance. And I exact these values in the capacity um, of managing director at the helm of a strategy and design practice now. But prior to this, I did spend 13 years in clinical practice in the realms of sports and emergency medicine, and I think critically as a trauma and compensations assessor. Um, in parallel, I've had the opportunity to advance issues of public health interest, uh, in some instances, at, right at the leading edge, six years on the board of the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation, as con as a contributor to Victoria's first strategic plan for pioneering gender-based violence prevention um, with Respect Victoria, which was recognised by the UN, 
as co-founder of the Australia-China Tobacco Control Collaboration Live Council, um, which uh, was endorsed by QUIT and the Cancer Council, as co-founder and strategist for Sugar Control Advocacy Group, Sugar by Half, alongside Australia's preeminent sports physician, um, Peter Bruckner, OAM, and founding chair of pioneering um, public health movement, Teachers Consent, which achieved national legislative reform to mandate consent education across schools in 2022. I feel the issue we're here to discuss tonight is equally as important as all of these um, issues, which I guess achieve far more recognition in um, the public domain. And I first came to this conversation around gender dysphoria and children in, I guess, a, a journalistic capacity. I'm not a journalist, but I had a podcast called Alternative Truth, which was syndicated by Austerio. Um, and in the interceding years, I've read widely, I've spoken to clinicians around the world, and most importantly, I've watched my friends as parents and step-parents struggle. Um, and I've, I've equally heard the alarm raised by clinicians behind closed doors. Now, I think it was the founders of Google that said, data kills politics. I think in the state of Victoria, unfortunately, we've seen instances where politics can kill data. Modern medicine was constructed on the premise of continuous scientific inquiry and evidence-informed practice. However, the policy conditions of our time have seen erosion of these core tenets, which rather than doing no harm, risk serious long-term consequences for, I believe, some of the most vulnerable people in our community. So today's forum is about beginning a process of reinstating a safe space for civil discourse amongst medical practitioners, surgeons, families, and policymakers. But beyond upholding principles, why is it so important for us to lean in now? Well, when we look out across the world at leading healthcare systems, what research is demonstrating, it departs from the narrative that dominates media, woke company collateral, and most critically, policy room discourse. Namely, that children presenting with gender dysphoria is an adaptive response to social and emotional conflict. In contemplating this, I'm going to furnish you with a few statements. In Sweden, a country that pioneered the affirmation model of care used in Victoria, all gender treatment for minors has been banned. A 2011 analysis of data for gender affirming care in Sweden, which, mind you, is a country that keeps complete records from birth to death for all 14 million of its population, their audit um, discovered that post-operative transsexual females who'd been living as men had several times increased rates of all-cause mortality and a suicide rate that was 40 times higher than age-matched peers in the general population. In the UK, um, independent examination of the Gender Identity Disorder Service, GIDS, um, under the CAS review resulted in the National Clinic, Tavistock, being closed. The NHS has proposed to end routine treatment with poorly evidenced puberty blockers, instead confining them to clinical trial. A recently published audit of UK's GIDS reported children presenting are 10 times more likely to have had a first degree relative as a registered sex offender. In both the UK and Norway, we now, they, they have now defined the medical treatment model of gender dysphoria as experimental. In France and Finland, steps to limit the medical treatment of gender dysphoria underway. In the US, many hospitals are discontinuing gender medicine due to legal liability. Closer to home, major indemnity provider MDA National has ceased providing cover to doctors treating minors in the private sector. Speaking to someone on the inside, they describe this as emblematic of out-of-court settlements. During the pandemic, we witnessed an exponential increase in young girls presenting to public gender services. Of these, and this is first-hand testimony from a clinician, 50% had access, not puberty blockers, but cross-sex hormones prior to assessment and um, uh, any official treatment. So if we're, draw, if we're to draw anything from this, I hope it is that if we're to form policy that's fit for purpose, we must have facts. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the esteemed Dr. Gillian Spencer, child and adolescent psychiatrist, who's going to... Um, do the basics, the 101. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a Monash girl, so feel 
quite a strong connection to um, Melbourne and Victoria. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today because I see it as one of my responsibilities as a child and adolescent psychiatrist to do what I can to ensure that mental health treatments for children are safe and evidence-based. And I feel I must speak out when they're not. It's important to note today that we're talking about children who are physically normal. They don't have any chromosomal abnormalities or disorders of sexual development. We're talking about children with gender dysphoria, which is where a child or adolescent has a stated desire to be the opposite sex and classically a preference for stereotypically opposite sex clothing, playmates and play activities and a dislike of their own sexual anatomy. So I'll just start by explaining a little bit about the affirmation model so that we know what we're all talking about. The affirmation model is a controversial treatment approach for children with gender dysphoria, which is currently in place Australia-wide. The affirmation model as it's currently practiced is to encourage all children to contemplate their gender. And then when a child develops or presents with gender dysphoria, they are considered to be naturally trans or gender diverse, and they are encouraged to socially transition which in, involves adopting opposite sex pronouns, appearance, and name. And the family are firmly encouraged to support the social transition on the grounds that it's a life-saving approach to prevent suicide, despite there being no evidence that this is true. The first medical step in the affirmation pathway is puberty blockers, which are prescribed at the very start of puberty. It's Tanner's stage two, uh, which is roughly age 10 to 12. Puberty blockers were originally conceptualised as giving children time to think, but what we know from their widespread use is that they prevent the child from recovering from gender dysphoria. In the 11 studies where the affirmation model was not used, so children were not given puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, 60 to 90% of children recovered from gender dysphoria through the course of adolescence. However, once on puberty blockers, <clears throat> Sorry, instead of recovering, about 95% of children will go on to take cross-sex hormones. Puberty blockers have side effects similar to menopause, like fatigue, hot flushes, weight gain and mood problems. They also reduce bone mineralization at a time of life when bones should be peaking in their bone density. There are suspected effects on cognitive and emotional development because adolescence is an important time for brain development. Last year, the FDA put a warning label on puberty blockers for a condition that causes raised intracranial pressure. The research studies indicate that treatment with puberty blockers does not lead to improvements in mood or psychosocial functioning or in the symptoms of gender dysphoria. There is no evidence that they reduce the risk of suicide. If puberty blockers are started in Tanner stage two as recommended, the child will be infertile and their sexual functioning will likely be impaired. There's a specific risk to boys from the puberty blockers because there isn't enough tissue for the vaginoplasty. So they require the use of some tissue from another site, which is a much more dangerous surgical procedure. Cross-sex hormones are prescribed to children when the child is able to consent. This now occurs in gender clinics from as early as the age of 14. In Australia, girls with gender dysphoria are having double mastectomies from the age of 15. Other gender surgeries tend to be taken, um, undertaken close to age 18. The threshold for a child being able to consent, um, to, be, to be able to, to be considered to have the capacity to consent to these gender treatments of hormones and surgeries was considerably lowered in 2016 by a family court decision Re Darrell. Prior to this case, to be considered able to consent, a child was required to fully understand what was proposed. In this family court case, a child and adolescent psychiatrist gave expert evidence to the court. I actually think she was a Queensland female child psychiatrist, so I'm proud of her. So she gave expert evidence to the court that no adolescent would be able to fully understand the lifelong implications of infertility, impaired sexual function, and the irreversible changes to the body, as well as the physical health side effects, consequences, and risks. However, unfortunately, instead of preserving an important principle that a child needs to fully understand 
the long-term consequences and risks of a treatment to be able to consent. The court buckled under the pressure from the gender clinic doctors who falsely claimed that these gender treatments were urgently needed to prevent suicide. So the threshold for consent was changed. Since 2016, an adolescent no longer needs to fully understand in order to consent. They only have to have the ability to consider different options and their consequences. In Australia over the last seven to eight years, we've had a massive increase in the number of children presenting with gender dysphoria. Historically, gender dysphoria affected a tiny proportion of children and they were predominantly prepubescent boys. These days, it's mainly adolescents, mainly adolescent females, and the adolescents presenting have high levels of comorbid, mental, mental illness, neurodiversity, histories of trauma, and they often have friends who are transitioning. Despite claiming ongoing high levels of discrimination and abuse towards trans people, the gender activists will tell you that this incredible increase in adolescents presenting to gender clinics is all due to a reduction in the stigma of being transgender. This is a completely implausible claim. If it was, if it was simply the impact of a reduction in stigma, this would result in a similar proportion of people across the lifespan identifying as trans, but this is not the case. The dramatic increase in people identifying as trans is disproportionately occurring amongst adolescent girls. The change in the sex of children presenting from historically always prepubescent boys to now predominantly adolescent girls also cannot be explained by a reduction in stigma. In addition, as May mentioned, there are countries such as Sweden, <clears throat> sorry, where culturally acceptance of gender transition has been high for a really long time. Sweden was the first country in the world to legalise gender transition in 1972. However, regardless of the lack of stigma in Sweden, they still saw a 1,500% increase in, the, in gender dysphoria amongst females aged 13 to 17 between 2008 and 2018. Due to this, in 2022, Sweden decided to by and large restrict hormonal and surgical treatments to adults. Historically, it has always been adolescent girls who have been the most susceptible to enacting social trends, particularly those related to distress turned inward. You sometimes hear the gender activists claiming that the recent massive increase in people identifying as trans is similar to the increase in people being left-handed between 1900 and 1960 during a period where there was a reduction in the stigma of being left-handed. Gender activists won't admit that there has not simply been a reduction in stigma occurring around the concept of being transgender. There has been a strong social movement focused on enthusiastically celebrating and promoting trans people. This has been occurring online, through community events, in books, on our televisions and in schools. In our community, it is children and adolescents who are most sensitive to social cues and messages. When children and adolescents identify as trans, they are stepping into a role where they are perceived as brave, emotionally complex and misunderstood, and they feel they are part of an important social justice movement. This can understandably be an intoxicating persona for some adolescents. It can also be an escape from distress or a solution to social difficulties. In making an erroneous comparison to left-handedness, the gender activists are being quite cruel in not acknowledging the deep concern of many parents of children with gender dysphoria who are going through a situation that is the equivalent of having always seen their child eating with a spoon in their right hand, completing their homework with their right hand, and playing racket sports with their right hand, suddenly in adolescence claiming to be left-handed, and health professionals treating parents with contempt if they don't affirm their child's hands pre hand preference. The affirmation model undermines the parent-child relationship and the entire structure of the family by putting the parents in a weak and frightened position. This is because the gender clinic clinicians provide false information to parents that without gender affirming care, their child will, be like will likely die by suicide. Also, parents fear losing their child because their child is being told online that if their parents don't affirm them, then they're hate-filled bigots and should be cut off. This undermining of parents often deprives children 
of the strong and confident parenting that they need in order to recover from their feelings of distress. I have heard your previous Victorian Premier say in Parliament that no child would choose to be trans because it is a very hard path in life. This statement demonstrates a profound lack of knowledge about the complexity of various children's lives. For example, it reflects a failure to empathically understand that girls with a history of sexual abuse or trauma might see, a way, might see transitioning as a way to be never hurt again. It fails to understand that children with autism spectrum disorders might go searching for a reason as to why they've always felt different and marginalised and that identifying as a trans person opens up opportunities for connection, which is a relief from the social isolation. Children with autism spectrum disorders also often react negatively to change and they have sensory sensitivities and so they can be anxious and uncomfortable with the bodily changes of puberty. They can see puberty blockers as a quick, quick way out of this distress. In supporting the use of the affirmation model, your previous Premier didn't seem to want to understand that some adolescents can be rejecting of their own feelings of same-sex attraction and that blocking puberty can be an escape from these desires. He didn't seem to want to dwell on the reasons why amongst the children referred to the Tavistock's Gender Identity Development Service in the UK, the proportion who were in out-of-home care or adopted was eight times higher than in their general population. Feelings of gender dysphoria can not only link to experiences of trauma, but can link to a child's feelings of uncertainty about where they belong in the world. Children and adolescents are at risk of trying to reinvent themselves as a strategy to escape past or current pain. It is not compassionate to ignore the complexity of this issue. It is not compassionate to ignore the complexity of the emotional world of children and adolescents and the complexities of their life experiences and the impact upon them of complexities in their family relationships. Public figures that promote a closed-minded approach towards any psychological or social factors contributing to a young person's gender dysphoria are making it much harder for mental health clinicians to do the important work of engaging psychotherapeutically to help these young children recover. The gender advocates ignore the significant body of neuroscience research on adolescents it is well established from MRI studies and cognitive research that the brains of adolescents are in a phase of rapid remodeling. The prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain responsible for abstract thinking, planning, impulse control, perspective taking and complex decision making, develops last and it is not completely developed until people are in their mid-twenties. This means that adolescents compared to adults find it more difficult to manage their emotions and to think through consequences. Even if the adolescent intellectually knows the risks and consequences, they may prioritise short-term rewards, such as connection to and acceptance by a peer group, or the short-term relief from distressing feelings and, emotion and sensations. The neuroscience research makes it clear that children and adolescents do not have the developmental and neurological capacity to consent to these long-term life-changing and potentially damaging gender interventions. Adolescents can embark on a journey of transition and continue along the path, hoping that they will finally feel better after they've gone through the next stage and the next stage. It takes people a long time to let go of something that they've come to believe will be the solution to all their difficulties. The diagnosis of gender dysphoria is based on a child's answers to questions, which can be influenced by a whole range of factors. We don't have a blood test or a scan to confirm the diagnosis. This makes it very dicey to be implementing such very serious long-term interventions on this basis. It is important to know that gender clinics are not set up to provide mental health services. Their approach to assessing children and families is radically different to that of a child and adolescent mental health service. Because the gender advocates believe that the children presenting to gender clinics are naturally trans, the gender clinics are set up as medical clinics. 
Yet we know that the children presenting to gender clinics have incredibly complex mental health problems and they are in desperate need of a proper mental health service. The gender clinics function as rapid assessment and treatment services and the only treatment they provide is the affirmation model. I just want to explain how a general child and adolescent service functions. So in a general child and adolescent service, a, clini a clinician will conduct an assessment over several sessions to understand the range of difficulties that the child is experiencing. The clinician will obtain information from the child and the family and also from the school and any other relevant stakeholders to explore all the possible biological, family, developmental and psychological factors affecting the child's symptoms. They will then develop an initial hypothesis about why the child is struggling and the clinician will then rely on the multidisciplinary team to help them further explore their hypothesis. For example, they might decide to involve the team psychologist to do a cognitive assessment or involve the team social worker to help them further assess the family dynamics. They will discuss the case with the team psychiatrist who may see the child to consider whether the child has a developmental disorder or a mental illness. And the clinician's understanding of the factors contributing to the child's presenting problems evolves over time with inputs from the team. As the clinician's understanding of all the contributing factors emerges, this guides the various interventions provided. However, with the gender clinics, a, a child presenting to with gender dysphoria is considered to be naturally trans or gender diverse. And what I have seen is that regardless of the complexity of the child's background and presentation, the gender clinic always comes to the same conclusion. They conclude that the child's gender dysphoria is persistent, insistent and consistent and should be treated using the affirmation model. Any other mental health or social problems the child is experiencing is attributed to the stigma of being transgender and these problems are expected to resolve through treatment with social transition, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and gender surgeries. The concept of having a multidisciplinary team in a gender clinic is meaningless when everyone in the team is contractually obliged to follow the affirmation model, which is written into the gender clinic's model of care. The gender clinics don't provide ongoing therapy. They may refer a child to an affirming psychologist in private practice for ongoing counselling. However, the Tavistock clinicians identified that once a child is on puberty blockers, it is very hard to get the child to engage in psychological therapy to work on their gender dysphoria. The affirmation model is radically different from any other treatment approach in child psychiatry. Child psychiatry has always regarded the years of childhood and adolescence as a time of incredible growth and change. We have never regarded a child's feelings or behaviours as fixed. We've always known that emotional and behavioural difficulties in childhood and adolescence ease with maturity. It is incredibly distressing for many of us working in child and adolescent mental health services to see how these gender clinics are operating. One, la one day last year, the team I was working in the hospital received an education session from a nurse at the gender clinic. And the topic of the education session was chest binding. The gender clinic nurse was, um, said that she was running education sessions on chest binding for all the school-based youth health nurses, which exist in all the public schools in Queensland. And I also found out that the hospital was running chest binder fitting sessions for adolescent girls. And the nurse um, said that these sessions were the, um, the favorite part of her job. And I knew at that stage that the binders um, destroy um, breast architecture. And so the breasts end up um, flat like a grandma's. And this reinforces a pathway towards double mastectomy. And um, I was very distressed because she explained that binders are expensive. So after the young person has their top surgery, they will donate their binder to a local NGO to be provided to another adolescent girl to use. And when I heard this, I felt concerned that my health service had lost its way. Sorry. And we're actively colluding with the disgust that some adolescent girls feel towards their bodies. Sorry. Um, gender activists constantly use the risk of suicide to justify implementing these inter interventions. However, there is no reliable evidence that gender dysphoria 
is associated with a higher suicide risk than other mental health problems in children. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, there's no reliable evidence that puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones reduce suicide risk. There's no reliable evidence that these interventions improve psychosocial outcomes. In my opinion, the most helpful first step that the government can take for all children and their families is to disallow the prescription of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria. We know that puberty blockers aren't safe because they don't allow the child their best chance at recovery from gender dysphoria, which is to go through puberty. Their best chance of recovery is to experience the full course of adolescence, which includes a broadening of the social group, a broadening of interests and activities, at the sexual awakening and the experiences of intimacy. It is not safe to have the option of puberty blockers available, even in limited circumstances, because children will imagine them to be a quick fix to their distress, and they will escalate in their emotions and behaviours to try and obtain them, and that creates a situation which is more risky. We are very lucky in child and adolescent psychiatry because the suicide rate amongst children and adolescents is thankfully very low. We do see a lot of children who report suicidal ideation with sincerity. For example, it, it wouldn't be uncommon for a child with um, anorexia to say that they will attempt suicide if made to, made to gain weight. Or kids with school refusal say that they will kill themselves if made to go to school. Our approach in these cases is always to watch them and support them and continue to do what is necessary to help them recover from their illness. Sadly, no, no child psychiatrist or psychiatrist has a crystal ball. When it comes to children with gender dysphoria, we have no way to identify which children will persist in their gender dysphoria, nor can we predict which of these children as adults will say that they are happy to have traded in their fertility, sexual function and physical health to be more likely to pass as the opposite sex. Doing more comprehensive and prolonged assessments will not get us any closer to knowing which children will persist in their gender dysphoria. The safest approach is to take a different approach. The, aff the affirmation model needs to go. What is often missing from in discussions about gender treatments for children are the voices of adults who experienced gender dysphoria in childhood but grew out of it. They value their fertility and their capacity for sexual pleasure and their good physical health. These are the lucky people from previous generations when the affirmation model was not in use. The voices of young adults who transitioned in childhood are starting to be heard in the privacy of GP and psychiatrist rooms across the country. We are starting to witness what it means for people to live with the devastating consequences of these interventions. This is often a group of lost young people with chronic fatigue and other medically unexplained health problems who are not able to function in the workforce and struggle to maintain relationships. They remain unhappy with their bodies, socially awkward, lonely and desperately unhappy. Their social world is often restricted to the queer community as they've lost other connections. They fear losing these connections if they were to acknowledge feelings of regret or attempt to detransition. De they remain trapped in the affirmation model. I'll just finish by saying that last month, it was three years since the harms of the affirmation model came into full public view with exposure of the Tavistock Clinic scandal and the UK government announced that they were commissioning the CAS review. This month, it is three years since the UK released their systematic reviews of, published, of the published research and concluded that there is no reliable evidence of benefit from puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. This three-year delay in taking action to prevent Australian children being harmed is part of this scandal. We urgently need an independent inquiry into the gender treatments being delivered to children across Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Gillian is going to be one of our panellists at the end, so you will have a chance to ask questions. Um, we are now joined by paediatrician um, Dr Dylan Wilson, who many of you might know um, for, I guess, writing an open letter to Australian doctors um, 
I think well over a year ago. Um, we've just got some technology happening. Um, yeah, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dylan Wilson. state, having navigated the difficulties of any medical condition and those stages of development. One of those stages of development is puberty. It's important to remember what puberty is. Puberty is the normal stage of human development that allows us to progress to full sexual and reproductive maturity. That is the ability to have sex and reproduce should it be desired. It is a stage of human development that brings complex hormonal changes, physical changes to our bodies, our brains, our status in society, and our social functioning. It is undoubtedly a challenging time for many humans, one that can cause distress, but it is also an essential stage of human development that allows us to become the adults we are. But the, despite the importance of this stage of human development, the model of care for children distressed about their identity, what is known as the affirmation model for children, seeks to deliberately deny these children this essential stage of human development. Can you hear me okay, Vons? Yes. Same progress. Wait. I'll keep going. Keep going. This is done by giving children injections of particular drugs, colloquially known as puberty blockers, at the first opportunity the gender clinics have. The stage of pubertal development that gender clinics strive for is Tanner stage two. The stage of, pub stage of puberty named after British pediatrician James Tanner after his research work in the 1960s. There are five stages for males and females. Tanner stage one is prepubertal. That is all children for whom known changes have yet commenced. Tanner stage five is full adult maturity. It can be hard for non-medical people to conceptualize Tanner stage two, but it is possible. I'd like everyone in the room to take a moment to think back to their childhood and adolescence and try and recall when they first started showing signs of puberty. For the females in the room, this would be the first sign of budding breast tissue. For the males in the room, it was the first signs of pubic hair developing with some early slight growth of the penis and testes. Try to recall what age that was for you. For some in the room, it would have been while still at primary school. Some of you have been, would have been the average age in the early years of high school, and some of you would have been late developers. Try to recall the age you were when those changes first started happening. That is Tanner stage two. Now hold that image of your younger self in your head for the entirety of this evening. Now imagine that your body from that age had never matured past that point. This is the reality of blocking puberty at this stage. While there would be linear growth, there would be no other maturation of anything else. If you had received puberty blockers, there would be no further growth or maturation of your genitals. There would have been no growth of breast tissue. There would have been no maturation alongside your peers. When one stops to think about your own experience of puberty, these concepts are easier to conceptualize. What is less clear is what would be going on inside your body. The maturation of sperm occurs in the late stages of puberty. Similarly, while females are born with all the eggs they will produce for their lifetime if puberty is completed, they require the hormones of puberty to fully mature. Without progressing to the later stages of puberty, you would not be able to produce sperm or eggs. You would be sterile. Equally, while you're still recalling your younger self at that beginning stage of puberty, what was your concept of sex and sexual functioning like? At the beginning of puberty, the idea of sex and sexual play early awakening. Sorry, yeah, you're going sorry. At the beginning of puberty, the idea of sex and sexual pleasure is only barely awakening. But without any progression, 
without any further growth of the genitals or impact of sex hormones on the rest of your body and brain, there is no awakening. There is no progression of any libido, any sexual arousal, any desire for a sexual partner. Consider these two outcomes. I stated earlier that the aim of puberty is to reach sexual and reproductive maturation. The treatment pathway administered by gender clinics seeks to deny children from reaching sexual and reproductive maturation. These children reach adulthood without the ability to reach reproduce. They reach adulthood without the capacity to experience sexual pleasure. Fundamental components of human existence are being denied to these children. In addition to this, there are impacts on bone health. There are irreversible effects of testosterone on female bodies and estrogen on male bodies. We know that nearly all children who commence puberty blockers progress onto these hormones. Because of this progression, it is essential that when commenced on puberty blockers that the children and their parents fully understand, fully understand, the consequences of these treatments. How is that possible? Consider your younger self again. Could you have understood the future sex life you were giving up? Or the chance to have a family of your own? It is not possible to consent children adequately for concepts they have yet to experience or require adult thinking to contemplate. Yet the gender clinics remove these life options from these children routinely in our children's hospitals. The word iatrogenic means harm caused by medical professionals. There is nothing physically wrong with the bodies of these children before they undertake this treatment pathway. But as a result of this treatment pathway, they receive iatrogenic harm. They are sterilized, rendered asexual or sexually dysfunctional, have their bone density affected, have the effects of cross-sex hormones for the rest of their lives, have their brains impacted to an unknown extent and will be medical patients for life. It is not possible to go through the puberty of the opposite sex. It is not possible for humans to change sex. It is incontrovertible that harms result from this pathway. Yet those proponents of this pathway do not openly acknowledge this harm. When iatrogenic harm occurs, it is essential to consider the reason the treatment was given in the first place and what the intended outcomes are. One should be absolutely sure that the benefits you claim will occur will outweigh the harms that will occur. Given the seriousness and severity of the harms that will occur, those advocating for this pathway need to demonstrate clearly what they are treating and what they propose to be the desired positive outcomes. What is being treated? The official diagnosis is gender dysphoria. What many do not realise is that the official diagnos diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria for pre-pubertal children relies on stereotypes. To receive a diagnosis, a child must meet six out of eight criteria. Five of the criteria are as follows. Number one, in boys, a strong preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire or in girls, a strong preference for wearing only typical masculine clothing and a strong resistance to the wearing of typical feminine clothing. Number two, a strong preference for cross-gender roles in make-believe play or fantasy play. Number three, a strong preference for toys, games, or activity activities stereotypically used or engaged by the other sex. Number four, a strong preference for playmates of the other sex. Number five, a strong re in boys, a strong rejection of typical masculine toys, games and activities, and strong avoidance of rough and tumble play. Or in girls, a strong rejection of typical feminine toys, games and activities. What if one does not believe that there is such a thing as boys' toys, or girls' toys, or clothes? What if one thinks it's perfectly natural for children to seek out friendships with other children regardless of their sex? What if it is a cross-gender role in make-believe play, and why is that abnormal? Even if taken together, they amount to the description of many, many children. Once again, I invite you to think back to your younger selves. How many females present had a strong resistance to the wearing of typical feminine clothing? How many males in the room avoided rough and tumble play? Rather than helping children in society challenge such stereotypes, the affirming clinicians use these stereotypes to confirm the child is trans. If the stereotypes are removed from the diagnosis, what is left? There is no doubt that there are children who are distressed about the sex they are and distressed about their bodies. But little consideration is given to the cause of that distress or any overlapping mental health issues. 
Instead, the stereotypes within the diagnostic criteria serve to highlight that the distress can only arise from a transgender identity. But without these stereotypes, what is being treated? The stereotypes present in the diagnostic criteria highlight the danger of social transition. Social transition is the act of treating a child as if they were the opposite sex, be that with clothes, hair, names or pronouns. But again, this is reliant on stereotypes. Is a girl who cuts her hair now a boy? Dr. Hilary Cass, past president of the UK's Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, in her interim report, emphasises that social transition is not a neutral act. It facilitates the idea, based on stereotypes, that a child can be the opposite sex, that they are the opposite sex, and helps fulfil the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria, which leads them towards a pathway of medical treatment. This is what is known as a cascade of intervention. Yet around the world and in Australia, children are socially transitioned as a seemingly kind act. Instead of saying, you can be a girl who has short hair, we are saying, if you have short hair, you are now a boy. Schools in Australia partake in this process. But instead of a kind act, they are facilitating the idea that it's possible to change sex. And I remind you that this is not possible. It is not an act of kindness to promise children something that can never be realised. What are the desired outcomes from this medical treatment? As Jillian highlighted, the most strident arguments that you will hear is that this treatment is life-saving with regards to suicide. However, this is not supported by the evidence. There was no epidemic of gender-distressed children and adolescents committing suicide prior to the advent of this treatment pathway. There has, therefore, been no drop in suicide in children as a result of this pathway being given. Systematic reviews have taken place looking at mental health outcomes. A systematic review is when independent researchers take all the available research, analyse it in detail for biases, errors and outcomes. The systematic reviews that have been conducted into puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for children conclude there is very low certainty of benefit to mental health outcomes. If you contrast very low certainty of improvements to mental health, with the very high certainty of iatrogenic harm as I have outlined, why is this pathway still being administered? It's important to highlight that many of the children commenced on puberty blockers are not suicidal, but are commenced on treatment after being told it is the only way to prevent any possible suicidal ideation in the future. It is not uncommon to hear from the children themselves, if it wasn't for this treatment, I wouldn't be here today. When I hear this said, I believe that child has been failed. They have been led to believe that the only option for their mental health distress, or potential future mental health distress, is to pharmacologically adulterate their bodies, instead of the usual methods of therapy, support and safeguarding that work so well for so many children. This is especially relevant given that we know, crucially, if supported in this manner, the vast majority of children's gender dysphoria will settle. The affirmative pathway does not give children this opportunity. It is evident that the aesthetic outcome is often prioritised. It is seen as desirable that a male appears more feminine as an adult while not going through male puberty. It is seen as desirable to prevent breast growth to allow females to appear more male. But at what cost? An aesthetically desirable outcome can only be achieved by inducing the atrogenic harm I've described. There are many trans adults who exist who have done nothing to their bodies. Changes in legislation have been made around Australia to remove the requirement for people to make changes to their bodies in order to meet legislative requirements because it has been, been recognised that these medical changes bring a significant burden to the health of trans identifying adults. It would do little to encourage children to seek out this adulthood where one can be trans without the negative consequences of medical treatments. This is not the only area of illogicality. If a 14-year-old Cameroonian girl is brought to the children's hospital suffering the physical consequences of breast ironing, a cultural practice that flattens the breast, it would trigger a notification to child protection services. But if a 14-year-old girl who identifies as male is brought into a children's hospital suffering the physical consequences of the breast binder, it could well be the children's hospital itself that supplied the binder. Both are cultural practices that flatten the breasts of girls to avoid womanhood. Why are they treated differently? 
It is often reported that very few children regret this treatment as adults. This is not true. We do not know if the number is very few, very many, or somewhere in between. The exact rates of regrets are not known because of the paucity of long-term follow-up data. No children's hospital in Australia has published any longitudinal data to date, despite, despite promises it will be coming. Overseas cohorts, such as the original Dutch research cohort, suffered high dropout rates in their longitudinal follow-up attempts. The fewer than 1% regrets their treatment claim comes from those who underwent genital surgery who were able to be followed up and not lost to follow up. We do not know how many females will regret their testosterone treatment or their mastectomy. We do not know what regret looks like in those who have been puberty blocked in Australia. The very best we can say is we do not know the long term outcomes. If we do not know, how can children and their parents consent? The only way this is possible is if it is acknowledged, acknowledged that this is experimental. Experimental treatments should be supervised as part of experimental research trials. This is why, in the UK, it has been determined and recommended by Dr. Hilary Cass that puberty blockers only be commenced as part of a research trial. This is where the affirmation model is fundamentally flawed. The research trials are now following the assertion that this is standard medical care instead of preceding this assertion. To summarise, this pathway incontrovertibly leads to iatrogenic harm. This pathway has scant evidence it helps the mental health of children. It is an experimental treatment. This pathway requires children to be able to fully understand adult concepts such as their future sex life and family at a young age, with the impact of cross-sex hormones on their bodies for years, a lifetime risk of associated iatrogenic disease, with little known about potential to regret their treatment. As such, I do not believe these children and their families can adequately consent to this pathway. My view is not an extremist view. As I stated at the beginning, I'm a general pediatrician whose role it is to help children reach adulthood as healthy as possible. My view is that I think it is essential for children to go through puberty to be healthy adults, to grow, to mature, develop, have crushes, relationships, love, sex, all with a healthy body. My view is that mental health distress should be treated with mental health support. This is not an extremist view. It is a view shared by many concerned institutions around the world when this pathway is scrutinised. It is an extremist view to believe that the best way to deal with the mental health distress of children is to hormonally adulterate their bodies. It is an extremist view to consider that puberty can be avoided and the consequences don't matter. It is an extremist view to believe that it is possible for humans to change sex. It is therefore imperative that inquiries are undertaken to have to consider why these views form the basis of treatments being offered to our children in children's hospitals. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan said. Let an inquiry proceed to establish the veracity of these extraordinary claims. There is nothing to be lost by an inquiry. The scrutiny only needs to be placed on the medical professionals advocating for this treatment. There is no need to scrutinise children. Only medical professionals fear scrutiny would object if they strongly believe in the pathway for which they advocate and commence, what would they have to fear? Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Dylan Wilson, for joining us all the way from Queensland. And while Dylan won't be able to join us for questions and answers afterwards, he's very generously offered to um, any stakeholders who do have further questions to pass them on through organisers and they will be answered. I also implore you to read his open letter to Australian doctors, which is referenced and free um, and available um, for all. So the next... Um, uh, expert is Dr. Peter Parry, who has well over three decades, am I being controversial, um, three decades of experience in child and adolescent psychiatry and is working in private practice at Northside Child and Youth um, Psychiatry. So without further ado, um, in Brisbane, but without further ado, please welcome um, Dr. Peter Parry.
Um, so you've just heard a lot of information from my two colleagues and it's uh, probably heavy going and there's going to be a lot more. So I suggest that everyone stands up and stretches for about 15 seconds and then we proceed. Just by way of background, I graduated from Adelaide Medical School 40 years ago. I served as a medical officer in the Royal Australian Navy, then worked as a GP before psychiatry training from 1990, subspecialising in child and adolescent psychiatry from 1995, so it's actually just under three decades of child psychiatry. I have worked in community and inpatient clinics in South Australia, the UK and Queensland, and been director of the Youth Inpatient Unit in Adelaide and director of mental health services at the Queensland Children's Hospital. I'm currently in private practice and locum work. Now I'm going to give some wider context to the issue of gender dysphoria with a preamble about psychiatric diagnosis in general. But as a preface, I note that people with mental issues, including gender dysphoria, must be provided with empathy and strictest professional and respectful care. It also goes without saying that parents love their children, whether they are agreeing or disagreeing with the transitioning. And clinicians are all believing that they're doing the right thing for their patients, whether they are of the affirmative school or of the more traditional biopsychosocial investigative approach school. Um, I, I have a PhD on the subject of a two-decade overdiagnosis epidemic of bipolar disorder in very young children in the United States. And my thesis was titled, Pediatric Bipolar Disorder, Why Did It Occur? the atrogenic consequences and implications for psychiatric nosology. I'm going to explain those terms. The atrogenic, which means harms caused by medical drugs and procedures, consequences of 25 years of over a million children and teens misdiagnosed and overmedicated, includes, according to a peer-reviewed publication in the official adverse event data of the FDA in the United States, is likely several thousand deaths mostly by a cardiac conduction problems from psychiatric drugs they mostly did not need. But moreover, it is parents, teachers, the children and young people themselves identifying with an illness the vast majority did not have, and therefore other causes of their emotional and behavioural problems were neglected. Nosology means the classification of diseases and diagnoses. A manual of psychiatric nosology is the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, the, of Mental Disorders of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, I, I've taught psychiatric nosology and assessment skills to mental health workers for about 20 years, and I give a lecture tomorrow. A basic tenet of psychiatric assessment and diagnosis is to not jump to conclusions. That simply listing symptoms consistent with a diagnosis in the DSM is often not an endpoint answer, but a starting point question as to why the person is concerned is exhibiting the symptoms. Depression can be reactive to, depression as an example, can be reactive to recent bereavement, ongoing abuse, major loss, poor lifestyle, drug and alcohol use, unresolved old traumas, something triggered, or familial vulnerability to a melancholic type of depression which overlaps with the depressive phase of bipolar disorder. It is not simple. Psychiatry requires longer sessions and usually several sessions to fully assess somebody and involves listening to family, teachers, and other relevant persons. As information is gathered, it's filtered through a grid of biological, psychological, and social factors, temporally partitioned into predisposing, precipitating, perpetuating, protective, and prognostic factors. And all that information then must be synthesized in an ind individual patient-centered manner for understanding their disorder or symptoms in what we in mental health call a biopsychosocial diagnostic formulation. This is standard. As an aside, because it might partly relate to the epidemic and gender dysphoria, in researching for my thesis, I encountered internal pharmaceutical industry documents released from criminal court cases involving companies like Eli Lilly, Johnson & Johnson, GSK, AstraZeneca, and Pfizer. My co-researcher and I published a peer-reviewed paper in a bioethics journal titled From Evidence-Based Medicine to Marketing-Based Medicine, Evidence from Internal Industry Documents. Over 400 documents plainly indicated that companies routinely suppress adverse event data and positively spin benefits data from their clinical trials to make drugs look safer and more effective. And they also engage in something called disease mongering to expand diagnosis boundaries so as to, quote, create markets. 
This occurred in the overdiagnosis epidemic of childhood and even adult bipolar disorder because the patents for most SSRI antidepressants were expiring in the early 2000s and the companies needed to make their new generation antipsychotic drugs more profitable by expanding the number of bipolar disorder diagnoses several fold. I've also taught developmental psychology and lifestyle factors in mental health, which both require a broad evolutionary paradigm view of what it means to be human. So what has this to do with responding to Dr. Dory's invite to come from Brisbane for this evening's forum? Well, gender dysphoria, formerly gender identity disorder, is a cluster of symptoms or characteristics that has been an object of study in psychiatry and mental health fields for decades. At the individual level, someone, particularly a minor with gender dysphoria, being uncomfortable with their observable birth sex as male or female, leaving aside extremely rare cases of intersex abnormalities, needs the assistance of a thorough assessment which should take at least a few sessions and discussions with parents, and the information be filtered through the biopsychosocial intersecting with time-dependent factors grid that I've just explained for a deeper understanding of why they feel this way. And until recent times, that is what the few gender clinics for the rare gender dysphoria cases did. Often a good biopsychosocial diagnostic formulation, fed back to the person in appropriate language that grants them deeper understanding of their symptoms, is therapeutic in itself. It at least allows the therapeutic journey to begin. With regards to gender dysphoria, in busy child and adolescent work involving supervisory oversight of community teams, inpatient units and emergency departments since 1995, I don't recall ever seeing a single female to male gender dysphoric patient until the late 20 teens. There was less than one handful of very effeminate boys and these boys seemed they might be more comfortable as females, but probably were on track before the last decade to being effeminate gay men and quite likely happy, particularly as modern society was becoming far less homophobic. What was strange was the inexorable rise in gender dysphoria cases since about 2017. The vast majority, typically 13 to 15 year old biological females, or maybe I can just say 13 to 15 year olds with two X chromosomes not wanting to grow up into women. Sex is binary at the cellular level, which is why lifelong hormones are needed to maintain a transgender physiology. Increasingly, these young teens with two X chromosomes would describe themselves as theys, as non-binaries, though often that was a stepping stone to wanting to transition to trans males. From none in two decades to a trickle for five years in a deluge in the past five years, and earlier this year, when working a week's locum on a six-bed adolescent mental health unit, there were, for memory, seven 14 to 15-year-old biologically female patients over the course of the week, of whom five identified as either non-binary or male. So at least in the Western world, we're dealing with a gender dysphoria epidemic. My doctoral research and my teaching the topic of nosology has made me aware of diagnostic epidemics in the mental health field. Might sound strange, but epidemics don't have to be viruses. For a quick run through of some, Coro is an anxiety syndrome where men believe their penises are retracting into their abdomens and occurs in epidemic outbreaks that can affect thousands of men in South and Southeast Asia and Africa. Mass hysteria of agitated people with anxiety related symptoms and associated autonomic nervous system disruption based on increased focus on their bodily symptoms and a vicious cycle and seeing others with the same have occurred throughout history. The dancing manias of the Middle Ages, where often mostly young women would dance till they dropped or even died, being an archetypal example. Sometimes this manifested as contagious laughing epidemics as infected nunneries in past centuries and Tanzanian schools in 1962, or many cases of Tourette's disorder in a New York school in 2011. In socially repressive Victorian times, hysteria was a way for mostly young women to express distress that they couldn't otherwise ventilate. Hypnosis and Freud's early career in psychoanalysis began as cures for widespread hysteria. Australia had an epidemic of RSI. Older ones remember that? Repetitive strain injury in the 1980s with the advent of word processors and increased keyboard usage. The occasional person still gets tenosynovitis from typing, but it's no longer an epidemic threatening to bankrupt work cover. 
most other countries never got the social contagion of RSI. It seems the positive reinforcement of work cover payments might have been a perpetuating factor here. I recall the satanic panic of the 1980s. It being seriously believed that numerous daycare centres in the US and then around the world were involved in satanic ritual abuse of children. Despite cases of paedophilia, as we know from the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Abuse occurring, the satanic panic was clearly gross social contagion and childcare workers were wrongfully and traumatically indicted and jailed. The multiple personality disorder epidemic in the 1990s followed. This affected thousands of clients as therapists explored interactions with their clients' various alters, allowing for increased identification with being a multiple. When the professions realized they were perpetuating cases by affirmative treatment and precipitating the creation of new cases as the public was influenced by both the media and psychology literature, the epidemic faded. And today, genuine dissociative identity disorder cases do exist, but are once again rare. We're perhaps going through another epidemic of ADHD where the benefits of taking psychostimulants to most people's concentration implies that large numbers of us have ADHD, but it's not that simple, and that's a discussion for another day. The autism spectrum epidemic directly relates to gender dysphoria. Diagnoses of ASD have exploded and overwhelmed the NDIS. The situation is nuanced. Cases missed in the past, now recognised. Pollutants and chemicals affecting fetal and infant brain development, more premature births surviving, older parents with older sperm and eggs, changes to microbiome from glyphosate in the food chain, these are all hypothesized causes of a real increase. But there are educational and financial incentives for ASD diagnoses, and some ASD diagnoses today are just normal introverted temperaments with a bit of obsessionality and quirkiness. Where the line is drawn becomes a matter of preference rather than objective diagnostic testing. Teenage girls, as Gillian has pointed out, on the ASD spectrum, or just shy and quirky, comprise many of those presenting to gender clinics. In the 90s and early 2000s, as a child psychiatrist, these girls and some boys would present as emo. It was a big movement, goth light, with histrionic misery replacing the histrionic aggro of the goths. Those identifying as emo usually had some anxiety, depression, or eating disorder comorbid symptoms. And as the predisposing, precipitating, perpetuating factors for these comorbid problems were addressed by usual mental health practice, the urge to be emo often faded. How many 30 and 40-somethings remain emo today? Some in the music industry, but most, <laughs> most have not. Now, that same demographic is presenting with gender dysphoria. But this time, a bill with almost identical wording has been introduced into many Western legislatures condemning health practitioners from exploring origins via a biopsychosocial assessment. Rather, it must be affirmation or possibly lose your license or go to jail even. We also have the first wave of detransitioners whose stories are multiplying on social media, bitter that psychological exploration of their dysphoria was not provided and distraught over medical sequelae that can include loss of orgasm and fertility. It seems several years before most take the difficult decision to detransition. Hormones cost over $1 million for life, let alone costs of surgery and analogous to the bipolar disorder false diagnosis epidemic fueled by millions in big pharma marketing, research grants and sponsored patient advocacy groups, the transactivist movement, according to the research of a professor Jennifer Bilek, it's her research, I'm just putting it out there, receives a hundred, hundreds of millions of coordinated financing from billionaires invested in the health industry, some wealthy transhumanists who wish to divorce our culture from its biological basis, and a billionaire trans woman philanthropist who's funding trans rights activism. And if this is as true as Professor Bilek's indicating, given such funding and international coordination, the sudden rise of gender dysphoria is not simply a grassroots phenomenon. Now look, it is true that feminine and masculine traits vary across the spectrum, and effeminate boys and tomboy girls always existed. Many grew up to be gay and lesbian, which thankfully it is easier to do today. But now this other option is available. So there's some fertile ground for that influence to work upon, just as there was with emotional dysregulation and tantrum behavior for the money fueling the childhood bipolar epidemic. I have four anecdotes to finish with. Firstly, 
I and another child psychiatrist presented with the AMA state president to a Queensland parliamentary committee about a law change in January 2020 that would have criminalised a non-affirmative approach with an 18-month jail term. I argued that two 14-year-old girls, I, was, I presented this to the committee, um, come into my clinic, not at the same time, but one after another, and each says the same thing. They're morbidly obese and want anorectic drugs followed by gastric sleeve surgery. The first chews candy, has a BMI of 41 and early type 2 diabetes just by their young age. I refer her to an obesity clinic where some of that treatment might be offered. The second is skeletal and about to die of starvation, so I admit her to hospital for forced refeeding under the Mental Health Act for anorexia nervosa. I went on to say, yet your bill in Parliament doesn't want me to make similar assessments of underlying causes for gender dysphoric teens? Now, the responses from the half dozen MPs suggest they hadn't quite thought of it like that, but they got the message. In the couple of weeks after our submission, 10 of my child psychiatrist colleagues in Queensland went out of their way to contact and thank me, some saying they were glad that a couple of us had the courage to speak up. We got an amendment to the bill that allows health practitioners to inquire of gender dysphoric children according to each profession's guidelines. And as a psychiatrist, I can therefore in private practice do that, but the psychologists in adjacent rooms to me need to be more careful as their society's guidelines chime with the affirmative model. So what care a young person gets in our private clinic is different depending on which door they walk through. Second, I saw a mother with her anxiety suffering biological daughter who was identifying as male and attending the gender clinic. The mother was trying hard to use the preferred male name and pronouns and convey that she was fully accepting of her now transitioning son. However, questioning revealed intergenerational domestic violence in a misogynistic patriarchal family culture and several male relatives incarcerated, including for murder. The mother had in fact fled with her two daughters and some of her sons to our region. Speaking with mother alone, she said her sons were abusive to her, typical of the social modeling they'd grown up with. Realizing she could express her feelings, she became teary and said, and I, I to quote her because it really stuck in my mind. I used to have my two girls who I could relate to as a woman I've lost the older one who is now a son, but has become aggressive like all the males in our family. And now I'm going to lose my last remaining daughter. And she cried. There's much to unpack in that case, but the obvious is why would you want to grow up to be a woman and victim of a domestically violent family culture? Third, quite a few of the female to male gender dysphoric cases have child sexual abuse histories. The generally accepted ballpark incidence of child sexual abuse is around 10%, higher in females and even higher in those with gender dysphoria. Abuse is often not disclosed until later in therapy. It is clear with some of these girls that becoming a feminine woman risks attracting males and re-traumatization. Becoming non-binary or trans male may subconsciously appeal as a way to avoid this. Others might tend towards promiscuity if gaining attention or affection has been sexualized. It is individual for every survivor, and of course others find ways to overcome. Fourth, final anecdote. I saw a very effeminate, genetically male teenager who from a young age had preferred girly toys, etc., and seemed quite happy transitioning. This seemed typical of the traditional rare cases of gender dysphoria prior to the current trend. And probably, if one thinks about it, the case of some cultures that uh, the far, far and Samoan culture, lady boys and Thai culture, that there's always been this male to female wanting to cross dress, etc., and, and live gay lifestyles. And one dearly hopes any future surgery goes well. However, possible medical or surgical complications and hormones for life do make one wonder whether an effeminate gay cross dressing lifestyle like the far, far might suffice. Several male to female, back to male detransitioners, describing loss of capacity for orgasm and other medical complications articulate that very sentiment. As these detransitioners indicate, and we'll hear from some tonight, we cannot escape biology. In terms of our biological driven psychology, we are an animal species, like any other, that responds to positive reinforcement cues, especially to be in harmony with herd or tribe and the group narrative. One of those reinforces is the reported millions of dollars flowing from the billionaires and transhumanist movement, Professor Bilek notes. 
Another is the social media, likes and shares that feed social contagion. Another is the new educational curricula. And another is the gender affirmative care model that could well be retitled the positive reinforcement model of care. And it generally eschews questioning for origins of symptoms in the way we would professionally practice for any other psychiatric disorder. Prior to the affirmative model, Professor Zucker, Canadian, who was the DSM chair of the Diagnostic Committee for Gender Identity Disorder, cited a desistance rate of 88% and a persistence to transgender rate of 12%, with what at the time was a small fraction of today's referral numbers. So, in the past, after compassionate exploration and watchful waiting, a minority of young people did indeed transition, more male to female, but the occasional female to male. And they, and all genuine cases today, including ones that wouldn't have come forward in the past, do need to be honoured and transgender care provided. However, the current positive reinforcement coming from everywhere provides parallels, as I see it, to 1990s multiple personality disorder or diagnosing thousands of preschoolers with bipolar disorder in the US, which was something that Professor Paris, the editor of the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry, said would one day be seen as, quote, the greatest scandal to befall psychiatry, end quote. Whether the current affirmative care model is also later seen as a scandal, we shall find out in the coming years. But it's good to start talking about it, and thank you. Thank you again, Peter, for a tour de force and giving us a picture of the long arc of psychiatry and how this phenomenon potentially fits in. I have a few words to um, share on behalf of Associate Professor Ramin Shayan, who um, has gone to great lengths to record something. However, due to being in the air at the moment and us unable to um, zoom him in, download the video, transfer it by any other means, um, apologizes for that not being available. That said, he did want to pass, I'll, I'll contextualize this by saying Ramin is um, a certified plastic surgeon practicing in um, public and private at St. Vincent's Hospital. He's also the esteemed head of the O'Brien Institute. I asked him to speak um, because when I, I um, raised this with him, he turned to me and said, look, I won't do sex reassignment surgery. And I thought that was interesting from one of the best surgeons in the state, if not country. And it, on deeper questioning, he said, well, this is why. I can't actually establish consent in an adult because when you do gender reassignment, I'm taking, I'm defying two of the core principles of plastic surgery, which are um, the restoration of function and form. He says, I, if I cut off your penis and invert that tissue and try and make a neo-vagina, um, there is no guarantee of form. In fact, the complication rate runs at near 100%. And I don't think that many people would tolerate anything approaching that level of danger. We wouldn't use a seat belt that fails 99% of the time. Um, but beyond that, there's no guarantee of any preservation of sexual function and you need only go on to Tumblr, as um, Dylan Wilson will really assist anyone, to see exactly what's happening with people that have bottom, so-called bottom surgery. Um, extending from that, and when we contemplate the context of tonight's discussion, I think it comes into sharp view what it means to really put a child on a pathway where they may almost certainly end up with pressure upon them to not only go from puberty blockers, which we... Um, statistically can say lead to the majority going on to have cross-sex hormones but at that point of uh, adulthood when it's legal to have surgical intervention the pressure is to go down a path that will leave them with a completely uncertain anatomical future and you know for a male to female transitioner to have to use something like a dilator every day to keep their neo-vagina which is a you know, a, a vagina formed by a surgeon, which is effectively a blind ending sac, open in order to simply urinate. You know, we haven't crossed the threshold of talking about physical intimacy. Um, so Ramin wanted to say that the, the idea of consenting an adult 
who's fully formed, who actually understands what it means to have sexual function um, and to live in their body as an adult is one thing. And he says he can't reach that threshold of comfort. But the idea of consenting a child, and he was an 11-year-old child, of which he is a father of one, he said is incomprehensible because it's, it's asking a child at 11 to agree to a future where they may need to dilate their neo-vagina simply to urinate. And, you know, to, to put it bluntly, he said, my 11-year-old can't decide on what pizza to get. So, again, Ramin will be available. We will um, transfer his video to anyone interested. Um, but without further ado, we are very lucky to be joined by, um, for the final talk before our panel, um, the Professor Emeritus Patrick um, Parkinson from Queensland um, School of Law. Hello. Hello, I'm Patrick Parkinson. I'm sorry I can't join you in person today. I've been asked to talk about the legal issues involved with gender dysphoria or gender incongruence and the treatment of children and young people. Let me break it down into three major issues to talk about. The first one is how we regulate this area. The second one is what the liability risks are for doctors and hospitals. And the third one is about the impact of conversion therapy legislation. Now, the position on the first one is that there is very little regulation at all in Australia now on the gender, um, on the treatment of gender dysphoric or gender incongruent children and young people. There, there used to be, it required the consent of the court to proceed with those treatments. But in Ray Kelvin in, in 2017, the full court or the family court said that if both parents consent and the doctors are recommending it, there's no need for court approval. Now, that comes with two very big limitations. First of all, there has to be a diagnosis of gender dysphoria in accordance with the DSM-5 criteria, the criteria set down in the major psychiatric handbook. And one of those criteria that has to be satisfied is there must be clinically significant distress. It's not uncommon these days to find young people who say that they are transgender or they are non-binary, but they're not distressed about that at all. It does just take it in their stride. They don't meet the criteria for um, gender dysphoria under the DSM-5, and therefore it would be unlawful to be prescribing them with puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. The second uh, limitation is that the treatment must be authorised and implemented by a multidisciplinary team. That was the promise made essentially by the Royal Children's Hospital that in Melbourne persuaded the court that they had standards uh, which were rigorous, that there was a multidisciplinary team which would conduct a thorough assessment. Uh, that team, including psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, endocrinologists, pediatricians, who could assess all aspects of the case very carefully, it is not lawful for GPs to be initiating the prescription of these drugs, even with both parents' consent, without an order of the court, because the whole basis of Ray Kelvin was that it should, there should be a multidisciplinary assessment by um, a clinical team in accordance with the Australian standards, which were then presented as being um, best practice to the court. So if parents don't agree, then one parent refuses consent, the other one wants to proceed, then it has to go to court. And in a number of cases, that is, that is, that is happening. Uh, and one of the great things about that is that the evidence can be thoroughly tested. The doctors have to persuade an independent decision maker uh, of the thoroughness of their assessment and the necessity, the absolute necessity of this treatment. And let me say that pushed in that way to justify what they are recommending, not all of them are able to do it. Well, that brings me to the second area of liability, which could become huge in coming years, the risk of being sued. That gives me no joy. I'd much rather um, not have anybody in, in, in injured and damaged by this movement. But the reality is that many are and are going to be, and they will have their remedies in court. And those remedies 
uh, could be on one of three lines. The first one is that the doctor was negligent in diagnosis, that he or she did not consider, or the team did not consider, the impact of other mental health difficulties, such as being on the autism spectrum, uh, as an explanation for why they may be gender dysphoric. Now, this is a question of belief, essentially. If you believe that every child has an innate gender identity and that that just waits to be discovered and that we must then affirm that child's gender identity, if that's your belief system, you won't believe that there's any possibility that other mental health issues could be masking uh, and lying behind a presentation of gender dysphoria. But that's going to be an issue that the courts will look at with very great seriousness in coming years. The second issue is whether the child or young person was given enough information to give an, an informed consent. And frankly, looking at some of the materials that I've seen even quite recently, they haven't been. One of the big issues on which children and young people do not seem to be much informed is the impact of the treatment on their adult sexual functioning. That impact is severe. That impact may mean that for a boy who's put on puberty blockers, going on to cross sex hormones, his testes may never mature. He may never have an orgasm in his life. That's the reality. And for girls, other significant impacts from vaginal atrophy and other effects of testosterone on the body. So these are things that ought to be thoroughly canvassed amongst many other issues in terms of long-term health risks. The law requires that even quite remote risks be made known to the patient before they can give an informed consent. Well, that brings me to the third issue. Can a 15-year-old, 16-year-old give that informed consent? You may say, well, they can do all sorts of things that age. Well, yes, but a lot of these young people suffer from other mental health burdens. They are on the autism spectrum in disproportionate numbers. They have other uh, difficulties, anxiety, depression, ADHD, anorexia. Uh, these are some very unwell teenagers. And can they consent? Can they understand the long-term implications of the treatment that is being pr proposed for them. These are really big issues that will be canvassed um, in the future. And I don't think the outcome is going to be favorable to the hospitals and the doctors. The third thing to say is about conversion therapy laws. These are having a devastating impact because remember so many of these young people are not only presenting with gender incongruence, some gulf between their natal sex and how they identify, but they also have many other significant mental health conditions or one or two other significant mental health conditions. And because the conversion therapy legislation is so draconian, even I've come across LGBT clinics have been saying, we're not gonna to touch these, these kids, it's too risky to risk uh, complaints to the regulators, to complaints to the um, health professional organizations, and even a, 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 a criminal case. And the result is that, as I understand it, these kids have been turned away, and they're not getting the other mental health uh, treatment that they need. Now, you may say, well, you could treat the ADHD or treat the other mental health issues, uh, but kids present as a whole that you can't really seg segment one part of the presentation away from its totality. And so these are some of the big legal issues that I hope as parliamentarians you will consider. The conversion therapy legislation has been a dreadful mistake. I think it's going to increase suicides, increase long-term mental distress for many young people. And let me finish by reminding you how many members of the Victorian parliament voted in favor of that legislation. Thank you. We have a final word um, from Mark Snedden, but um, I might get our panellists settled um, while we hear from Peter. And perhaps we can get our panellists a glass of water. I'm not sure if there's anyone at the back who can make that happen. Thank you. So, sorry, without further ado, Mark Snedden. Are you
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me along. I am a rose among thorns or a thorn among roses. I'm the only lawyer speaking tonight uh, in a bevy of medical experts. Um, I have uh, practiced law for nearly 30 years, been an associate professor of law at the University of Melbourne um, in a large law firm, Clayton Utes. I was also crown counsel to the State Attorney General and Premier's Office under the Napthine uh, government and then under the uh, Andrews government under Martin Bakula. And since then, I run a think tank which looks at these sorts of issues called the Institute for Civil Society, and I run my own legal practice. So, um, and in fact, last week I was spending about six hours lobbying both the uh, New South Wales government and the New South Wales opposition why not to introduce a change of suppression practices legislation in New South Wales. Okay, so I just want to canvas quickly some legal issues before we hear from um, some of the real stars here who have personal and no doubt poignant stories to tell. So let me start with the Kira Bell case. Uh, Kira Bell was a 16-year-old natal girl who's diagnosed with gender dysphoria at the Tavistock Gender uh, Clinic in London. She was diagnosed, I think, initially at 15, and she was put on puberty blockers and hormones at about 15. She later had a double mastectomy. Uh, in her early 20s, she greatly regretted uh, that uh, what she had gone through, uh, even though she had sought all of those things, and she sought to de-transition her body back to female appearance. Uh, she sued the Tavistock, not in negligence, um, but claiming that it had acted unlawfully in prescribing puberty blockers to her uh, and uh, cross-sex hormones under in, and uh, commending her for, under, for uh, cross-sex hormones while under 18, on the basis that she, people under 18 could not give informed consent. So she wasn't actually saying that she couldn't have given informed consent. She was saying, you are acting illegally in your procedures by giving these sorts of treatment to people who are not capable of giving what the law calls Gillick consent. Gillick consent is that you must be able to understand the nature of what is being proposed, the consequences of the treatment, and you must be able to understand and make a, a sound decision on your own interests as to whether or not to proceed with it. That's the normal test for, for medical uh, consent. She won at first instance in the divisional court uh, of three judges, which described puberty blockers as an experimental treatment and generally beyond the capacity of people under 16 to consent to. Um, that was re reversed in the Court of Appeal because they said, well, it's really a matter for the medical practitioners to judge Gillick consent rather than making blanket rules as to whether someone under 16 or over 16 can. So it was, remember, this is about the general rules, not about Kira Bell in particular. And the Court of Appeal said, we can't, we can't make a bright line rule that no one under 16 can ever consent to this, but... It's, they gave plenty of hints that you'd need to have very good, uh, a very good confidence in your assessment that someone under 16 could do so. Well, following public concern after the Kira Bell case, they set up the CAS review, which you already heard a number of speakers refer to. Um, the CAS review said uh, the most difficult question was about puberty blockers, whether they were provided valuable time as emergency treatment to interrupt um, puberty or whether they were effectively locked in children. Uh, and data from both the Netherlands and from GIDS Tavistock showed that almost all children, 96.5 or 98%, who were put on puberty blockers went on to cross-sex hormones and then maybe on to uh, top or bottom surgery. So there were not a pause in practice for people at all. Um, the, the CAS review also said there are unknown impacts of PBs on development, maturation and cognition, but you've heard that from the experts already. So in June of this year, NHS said there is not enough evidence to support the safety or clinical effectiveness of puberty blockers to make the, the, the treatment routinely available. So they will be limited to supervised clinical trial studies. Uh, question for you and for me and for everyone in this room is why isn't that the case in Australia? Okay. Um, let me then just move on quickly to a couple of issues which my friend and colleague Patrick Parkinson raised also. What about lawsuits about medical gender transition? Well, a, a lawsuit in negligence, and like him, I'm not. I'm, I'm grateful for the for the um, medical practitioners who have the courage to stand up tonight and and swim against the stream. Okay. And and we need more people exercising moral courage in this day and age in all fields of life. So well well done them. Um, 
if you were going to bring a lawsuit negligence, you could frame it in a number of ways. You could say there was an inadequate investigation of the patient's issues. There was just a ideological predisposition to a particular diagnosis. Bang, you're on the conveyor belt. You could say you ignored other pathologies. You didn't investigate this particular individual properly. That was negligent. You could say that you prescribed inadequately researched treatments like puberty blockers, the long-term effects of which were not known, etc. And then there are the issues about patient consent. Could this particular patient meet the test of Gillick competence and understand and give informed consent to what they were doing? So we have in the UK, for example, a number of cases along that line. Richie Heron uh, had a vaginoplasty at 31, and he's suing the NHS for medical negligence. And there are plaintiff's lawyers who are supposedly preparing a 1,000 adolescent patient class action against the NHS GIDS. I haven't, nothing surfaced in the public record about that yet. There are, as you would expect, multiple lawsuits in the United States on this area. In Australia, there are two that I know of. Uh, one is a case called Langadinos and Tui, which has been in the press. And May 2010, a Sydney woman, Jay Langadinos, saw psychiatrist Dr. Patrick Tui when she was 19, living at home, identifying as a male. She sought and he prescribed sex hormones. She later sought uh, permission or, or, or um, a certification that she was competent to undergo bilateral mastectomy and a hysterectomy. And he said there was no psychiatric contraind contraindication for her to do so. Um, Jay has regretted and detransitioned and is now suing Tui for professional negligence because she said she had a range of other psychiatric disorders at the time, which would have made it impossible for her to give informed consent in those cases. Now, I'm not making any comment about the rights and wrongs of that particular case, and I note that Jay was an adult at all times when she was requesting advice and, uh, and procedures from Dr. Tui. Uh, but there is there's a significant issue in here about the professional responsibility of these individuals and the surgeons. I mean, we, we've just heard from... Um, uh, one plastic surgeon who said, I would not do that. But clearly there are other plastic surgeons who say someone's ticked it off somewhere, so I'll execute the surgery. So the insurer MDA National has said it will also no longer insure private doctors such as general practitioners from legal claims arising from the assessment of patients under 18 as suitable for gender transition treatments. That's one of the four main uh, private uh, doctor insurers. So that would be Good if that extended on further, because that will be a thing that will, inter that will stop it very quickly. But that won't stop it in government hospitals, because that they, they're not insured by the private insurance. Um, second area to look at is family law, and I think Patrick Parkinson adverted briefly to this. Um, in a couple of cases uh, in the 2000s, the courts, the family court determined it would only get involved in cases of giving permission or not giving permission for gender transition where either one of the parents or the clinician disagreed with the proposed gender treatment. That usually turns out to be one of the parents. Um, and that was because the full family court accepted expert evidence from the medicos in that case that the affirmation approach was sound practice and treatment by puberty blockers had no harmful long-term effects and was reversible. That was thought to be the best evidence at the time. There is an excellent paper by a barrister at the Victorian Bar called Bell Lane, B-E-L-L-E, I see a few of you nodding, L-A-N-E, which goes through this in great detail and says that decision of the full court of the family court uh, was made on the basis of evidence which has now changed. We now know that some of this, uh, well, we know the effects of puberty blockers, as revealed in the CAS review, are quite different to what was the basis for that decision, and that decision ought to be reviewed. Uh, there is a recent case uh, in November 22 in the family court, no names because you can't publish anything like that in the family court but a Melbourne lawyer Bill Cordos acted in that case and uh, where the parents the reason it got into the family court is the parents were disagreeing about what was the appropriate uh, treatment for the child and the I can't remember which parent it was the parent who was against the gender affirming treatment uh, was able to put um, the relevant doctors uh, and clinicians from the Royal Children's Hospital Gender Service on the stand and, and asked them some tough questions about why they were doing it, what their evidence basis was. And the net result of that case was that the other parent uh, became sufficiently convinced it was not a good idea that the other parent withdrew their objection and the child did not go through gender-affirming procedure. Now, there was not a decision of the judge in that case because it settled because the parents came to an agreement. But it's that sort of litigation we're not. But what we most need, I think, is some sort of sensible, independent inquiry into all of this because we seem to be continuing down a path where 
I understand there's a great division around the world, but quite a few countries are reversing their position on where they were, and we need to stop and have a look at it. The final point I wanted to discuss is this ideological legislation, which makes the whole problem worse. And that is the change of suppression practices legislation. We have that law in Australia in three jurisdictions in Queensland, although in no, no, uh, I was going to say it's not too bad, but it is bad. It's just as bad for my medical colleagues um, because it applies only to health service providers and prevents health service providers from engaging in change of suppression practices. But in Victoria and the ACT, it applies to everybody. It applies to parents and friends and family and counsellors and if you're religious, you're priest or you're imam. Uh, nobody in Victoria can engage in practice or conduct directed to a person on the basis of the person's sexual orientation or gender identity for the purpose of changing or suppressing your sexual orientation or gender identity. Gender identity is unhelpfully defined as your gender-related identity. Uh, and you can try and work that out in more detail, and that would be a discussion for another time. It clearly covers psychiatry, psychology, counselling, and prayer. And then there are some defences or exceptions. So there is a defence or an exception for uh, a health service provider who uh, is convinced that in their reasonable professional judgment, the medical course they're going to undertake is necessary for the patient's welfare. Necessary for the patient's welfare. There's also another exception that if you're assisting someone to transition or you're assisting someone to consider transitioning, fine, all good. So the real problem with this legislation is the thumb on the scales. And if I'm advising a medical practitioner and I say, well, you've got all your normal duties of care, your clinical requirements and so on. And in addition, the Change of Suppression Practices Act says to you, if you want to go down the affirmation path, no problem. Knock yourself out. If you don't, if you want to say to someone, maybe we should do the holistic assessment and pause puberty blockers and not do that sort of thing, then it's entirely possible that the Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission might come and talk to you and say, well, that's a suppression practice. And then you'll have to say, oh, but in my reasonable professional judgment, this is necessary for me to treat the patient. So you have to mount a defence in Victoria if you're a medical practitioner trying to do that, whereas if you're going the other way, no problem at all. Let me just finish by telling you what the um, Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission has said about this, it has guidance. Um, I, I, um, I think at some points, uh, I'll just express myself carefully, the guidance put out by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission is, uh, it goes a little bit beyond the legislation. Uh, that is, uh, it, it may not be entirely faithful to what was said by the Attorney General in parliamentary debates and answer to questions by Mr. Limbrick and others, uh, and it may not entirely square with it. Never, so just treat with some caution. But this is the question on the question and answer on their website. Does the Change and Suppression Act capture wait and see approaches to gender transition? Well, answer. Change or suppression practices includes those that seek to suppress a child's sexual orientation or gender identity. Suppression may include, for example, trying to stifle or stop your child's need to be a different gender than they were assigned at birth. Whether the definition captures wait and see approaches depends on the circumstances that people are in. Parent or carer may be engaging in a change or suppression practice if they deliberately cause long delays, especially as some treatments are time critical. An example is waiting until the child is 18 to permit that child access to professional health advice in the hope the child, the delay will stop the child's gender identity or sexual orientation. Now, I don't think any parent is going to stop someone seeing a doctor until 18. What they're really talking about here is puberty blockers uh, without actually saying it. Right. I think this is a, a shameful business that we have this law in Victoria and that the Human Rights Commission and and that and that the Human Rights Commission is is advising people in this sort of chilling, intimidatory fashion. I think it's really bad. And that's why I'm spending quite a bit of time with New South Wales to try to avoid them going down the same path. I I do not want to frighten parents in the room. You, I think you still need to do the right thing by your child. Uh, and the best thing you can do is seek out a sensible doctor who will, or psychiatrist or psychologist, 
Who uh, you might have to go to Queensland. No, <laughs> sorry, I'm sure they're in Victoria, but they're probably fearful. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But seek out a sensible doctor because if you have someone who is sensible and brave, they can use that defence in the act to say, in my reasonable professional judgment, this is the necessary course for this patient. And if a parent is following what a doctor is saying, and the doctor's prepared to say that, I cannot see the Human Rights Commission trying to come after that parent. That seems to me to be your best course uh, at the moment. Right. I, I probably shouldn't take any questions, but... Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Please. Please do. So I want to turn it on. Oh, <laughs> um, so I'm with a collective of parents known as parents of adolescents with gender distress. Um, so we're a collective of around 30 families with children ranging from around 10 to 25, all with gender distress. Um, it's an enormous frustration to me that we have this legislation. It's an enormous frustration to me that we don't talk about the components, the exemptions that are in there that talk about facilitating coping skills, mm. identity development, and parents and medical practitioners are being scared off talking to children and we're allowing that to happen. So for every medical practitioner in the room, I would encourage you to read the legislation in finite detail and understand exactly what it says because it is not helping us as parents to scare the general population and say you must have moved. There, there, are, there are exemptions that <coughs> parents need to stand up and fight for those exemptions and fight for it to be improved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for your um, patience and engagement. It it has been a um, a long evening, and I know um, many of you have travelled to be here. Um, we're on the home straight, but I do want to acknowledge just how significant and problematic the legislative environment is in Victoria, and also that many people in this room, Bev, I know included, actually crossed the floor on that bill, which is in the way of... Um, independent thinking, of which I'm a fan. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, Jay, who Mark referenced, is actually in the room with us on the panel, and um, Mel, two detransitioners. Um, we're going to keep this panel pretty short and sharp. Um, that said, everyone on the panel will be here afterwards for refreshments um, to take questions. I'll take a few from the floor, but just sort of managing expectations. Um, Jay's got the mic. Oh, Mel's going to start. Okay. There's two mics. Great. One each. Well, I'm going to get one of you to kick off and um, tell us a bit about your story. That, oh, <laughs> we got to work it. Uh, I was going to start off with a spicy take. Um, just something that like I heard like a lot of the medical professionals um, talking about like, oh, one of the biggest issues for children transitioning. Oh, yeah, I'm Mel. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> with the transition, I don't know, like how much, how much do I have to flesh it out? <laughs> oh, uh, it wasn't last week. It was like um, uh, something like that. <laughs> Father's Day. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, oh, the spicy take. Uh listen, we can't. I can't go on without doing that. Um, like uh, one of the points that they were really drilling is uh. Uh, you know that, that that people lose sexual function, and that like I mean that's sad, but it's like listen like that will probably convince some people, but it's like literally when you've kind of gone through it, it's like that's like the least of my worries. Like, so it's just kind of like weird to hear like people constantly pushing on that issue, like oh your children won't have sexual desire, they won't have. It's like most of the trans people I knew were asexual, like within that community. It's like. So I don't know, that's probably something to explore, but also that was just kind of annoying because it's like, I mean, that's one aspect of life and other people value stuff differently, but it's just like everything I've gone through, like that's like literally like last thing. Oh, uh, yeah. 
share a little bit about what's motivated you to come and like your best your time and speak to this room? Does it want it say that what's really motivated you? I was going to say joke answer, but let's be serious. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Cause, um, there was a thing Posey Parker said, I, I like watched like one of her things ages ago. And like, I watched how the let women speak events went in, uh, Melbourne and, uh, New Zealand particularly. And one of the things she said was, if it's not, if not you, then who? So it was kind of like, that really hit something with me where it's like, It's your turn. <laughs> yeah, Jay, welcome. I think you come all the way down to New South Wales. Some of your story was laid out. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll stand on this. Jay, thank you for traveling all the way down from Sydney. Um, I know some of your story was touched on by Mark, certainly the technical background, but It'd be wonderful if you um, would just launch us out with a, a little bit of um, what you've experienced and, you know, your take on the conversation tonight. Um, so I'll share my experience from childhood. Um, my distress began when I was a child due to my parents. Um, they weren't accepting of my tomboy nature. And from there, they would continue to always say something about my preference for male clothing um, and short hair. And I grew um, confused and I became distressed with my body from puberty. Because of my mother, she would comment on my body and touch my breasts, um, which would happen quite frequently. And then I thought I was male because I was confused with all the things that my parents were telling me that I should be feminine and wear girls' clothes and have long hair. Um, mm. And then when I was an adult, I began to transition medically. Um, and I was 19 when I took testosterone and I had a mastectomy and a hysterectomy. Could you tell us a bit about how you feel um, regarding your experience of the medical system? Um, so I wasn't encouraged to explore my feelings um, and to discover where my distress came from. Um, and I was fast-tracked under hormones. So if somebody had said to me, what are you feeling? Why are you feeling it? Where do you think it's coming from? I wouldn't have transitioned because then I would have realised that it was coming from trauma from my childhood. Um, Mel, crossing back to you, I was wondering if you would um, give us your reflections on your, I know there's some doctors in the room, you're not going to offend anyone, but um, listen, I don't have, <laughs> don't have a nice word to, no, um, <laughs> I'm coming for you. Um, uh, <laughs> um, actually, like, uh, I guess the thing that spotlight kind of demonstrates, is like, obviously I went topless and you could see, uh, like my self-harm scars, the effects of testosterone, like my body dysmorphic slash eating disorder stuff. Cause I've gained a lot of weight to try and like regulate the distress that I feel from, uh, existing. But, um, I think the thing that doesn't really get spoken about is the emotional scars. So it's like. like putting my trust back in like the same people that did this to me. Like everyone like asks like, oh, do you have good support? And it's like, no, because I'm, how do I trust the same people that like couldn't be, like I got in this position through their help. It's like, I don't know, there's like, I feel like really angry at them, but then it's like I turn it on in with it myself as well. So it's just like, it's kind of a, it's a lot, but it was <laughs> listening to the medical professionals earlier when they like talking about stuff. They're like, oh, if you have autism or um, eating disorder or sexual trauma, or you're trying to escape harm. I was like, damn, they're like friendly fire. Like you're gunning for me right now. Like that was rough. Like all the substance abuse stuff. And I was like, oh my God, this hurts. Cause it's just like, 
you're just like summarizing my experiences and being like, oh yeah, this is why people do it. And it's like, yeah, it is, I guess. <laughs> like, but yeah, that kind of like, yeah, I don't know. It was rough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that oh, was all rough. these things. <laughs> it's like, um, oh, check, check, <laughs> check. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's it's hardcore to be in a room while it we're all speaking about something that you've lived. Um, I am going to invite a couple of questions, so I'm going to ask you to prepare yourselves, Oof. but um, wanted to give the mic to, well, we can, Jill and Peter simultaneously um, to perhaps pose a question to Mel and Jay. To, to pose a question to Mel and Jay. Yeah, what do you want to ask? Lay that out for us. And then, then to well, the Well, um, presumably... Presumably there was a time after you transitioned and you've both had surgery, so you've gone a long way down the track, that you thought, great, you know, this is what I've been you know, wanting or something, or I've thought I've been wanting. Um, so what happened around that? And when did that start to shift for you? And how long did it take? You got this. You've been here. Um, so when I had my mastectomy, I, I, I became depressed, but I thought that my depression was because I still had my female re reproductive system. So I became fixated and I was consumed with the thought of having more surgery. And I thought that that distress would alleviate once I'd had that operation. I didn't connect it to, it could possibly be other things. Um, sorry. How long was it before you, how long was it before you thought, no, this is what I, I, I don't want, even though I thought I did want? It Was it months or years? Um, so when I had my mastectomy, I was at the next doctor within a month. Um, and then I had organized that operation, um, at that first appointment and I had that operation six months after, um, that appointment. And when I had that operation, I, it was then that I realized that I wasn't getting what I thought I would from it. Um, and I had a breakdown for about a year and I couldn't function. Um, so it was after that year that I went to therapy and then I realized. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got my mastectomy in, uh, 2017 and then it was interesting. Like, uh, it took me about four years cause I hit like, there's not really a rock bottom. It's just kind of like a low spot cause it. Honestly, you just keep learning that <laughs> they can be a new rock bottom that you're going to reach. But um, I was like, I got the mistake to me and then I started like using food as a massive way to cope. And like, obviously now it's like hindsight. It's like, oh, that didn't actually fix any of the things I was dealing with. So I was like, when I was kind of eating myself to death and during the COVID lockdowns, it was kind of like actually like... I actually have to change stuff and like, cause it's not working. And it's like, I hit like 135 kilos and, um, yeah. So I guess hindsight's 2020 when you're like, oh, that worked out well for me, I guess. Well, uh -huh. never, I'll never wipe these tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that. It's moisturizing my skin. All right. Um, that's also how I feel about crying, by the way. Yeah. yeah. It's a good attitude. Let's get this skin nice. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Um, I'm sure there's some burning hands. I'm going to bring the mic to you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. And um, I... Um, I have one question. We often asked, or it was a bit of the discussion, um, you know, like is there, you know, that people debate is there regret rate or not and how big is it? But I actually thought isn't actually the question we should really ask, for example, when we do make an inquiry into all of this, 
we should ask not what's the regret right or but actually how many people were actually treated um well falsely or where actually there was an alternative um, for a less invasive treatment and i think that should what do you think about that if that should with um you know that should rather be the question sort of speaking about regret but rather how many people actually went through that which actually should never have um, gotten through that or been exposed to this treatment? Uh, I guess that's a real question, right? Because like after the spotlight thing came out, it was the argument of like, oh, these people were never really trans, right? So it's like, I guess that like, brings in the question of the whole mental health system is like, if I was trans, then this was appropriate. So then it, I do count as a regret, right? If I wasn't trans, then that's a failure on the medical system to not properly assess and like figure out the underlying um, stuff. I only just got um, an autism di diagnosis early this year. So that was like, wow, that explains like 90% of my um, like symptoms or my experience. Because like all the other diagnoses till that point, and I've collected like 10 or more, probably more actually, but like they'd only explain like maybe 50, 60% of what I was experiencing and like the way I navigated the world. Um. What? <laughs> <laughs> also, that was an, that's another thing is like, oh, the regret rates only, only so much. And it's like, well, what's the long-term follow-up people? Cause like, it's pretty like, it's like 12 months or something, but it's like, I've like disconnected from all the people that like helped me get to this point. So it's like, if you're not, just because you're not hearing from people doesn't mean there's no like response. It's literally like, I don't want to deal with you. <laughs> like, why would you? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I, like, why would I? Like, I don't want to fuck with you anymore. Like, <laughs> I'm not in a great position from this. Um, I know there were some other hands at the back. Um, we'll take one from the middle. First of all, thank you very much to uh, all of the, the speakers tonight. Um, some earlier this evening it was alluded to that uh, children who identified as or were diagnosed as trans uh, were more likely to have someone in close proximity who was a, a registered sex offender I believe and I was curious as to are there are there other signs uh, as to the type of parent or clinician uh, or guardian that may be predisposed or incentivized to making their kid trans, for lack of a, a better way of putting it. Do you like to hear? Well, well but you, you have, so you're questioning about motive. Is that it? Yeah, I, I suppose, or, or yeah. uh, personality dispositions uh, that may... Yeah, look, make um, a child more in it's, danger. It's axiomatic in psychiatry, psychology, that we can, at a conscious ego level, believe we're doing the best thing. That that, but we could have subconscious motivations that really aren't that pure. That through various uh, repressions, um, you know, we're not fully aware of. That, that's why people go to long-term psychotherapy. And at least in other disorders, there's a long history of Munchausen's disorder and Munchausen's by proxy disorder. Um, and even there, you know, the, um, you know, where a parent's doing something very harmful to their, their child, they, they might at a conscious level still believe that, you know, they're the best parent and love them and everything. So motivations amongst us complex animals called humans you know with frontal lobes that are very rational and logical at the best when they're switched on um, but limbic systems and deeper structures where we're much more instinctual and we have buried traumas and we do things because of i mean it's it's a whole you know it's it's a it's a whole university course in itself you know psychoanalysis psychodynamics so, so what I'm trying to say is I think we shouldn't say that people have got bad motives at a conscious level. People do the best they can, mostly. 
But personality disorder, by the very nature of it, means that more subconscious things are sometimes operating and directing behavior. Just on that, are there certain um, traits that I suppose make us suspective or um, eyes wide open to the potential for something like Munchausen's by proxy um, in a guardian or a clinician? And could that potentially apply to these kids that are getting diagnosed as traits? <laughs> Well, I think the the thing that's different with um, you know a parent who's uh, uh, you know putting some kind of toxin into you know, the the water that's causing their child to be sick and in hospital all the time, uh, classic Munchausen by proxy, and the someone who's helping their child transition, is that we're in a culture now where to help your child transition is kind of celebrated, rewarded. Um, and so uh, it's uh, it's a it's a bit different, it, you know. That the it may be there, it may not be there, but for many parents, they think they're doing the right thing, and maybe through and through without any subconscious problems. It, we now have a, a positive reinforcement culture at so many different levels: legal, social, educational, peer groups. Yeah gender affirmative care model. I'm going to take one question from um, the middle, then release everyone to the chicken sandwiches. Um. Hi, I just wanted to again thank Jay and Mel for coming particularly to tell us about their stories. Um, and I had a couple of questions. Um, firstly, just how open are you able to be with people that you meet these days about the fact that you have this history of of transitioning and detransitioning, and what changes would you hope to see in society to help us, like to help people who have been through those experiences to navigate that better and to have better lives? Uh, the second one is a really hard one and it might take a while to answer, but I'll go with the first one, all right? <laughs> Let's go with the easy one. Uh, I don't really give a fuck, I guess. It's like, if I like, I spend so much of my life basing myself on how others perceive me when it's like, if I'm good with myself, like, like, yeah, it's nice people come up and like, you're so brave and so courageous. It's like, some people think I'm a shit. So it's just like, <laughs> I can't really take all of that on. It's like, it's a very nice sentiment, but it's also like, I, like for me to be like centered and stuff, it's just like, I don't know, thoughts. Um, I think with just, I think um, people should question their feelings rather than just think that um, a feeling of discomfort automatically means that they're in the wrong body, that they're male or female, um, and that it, it could stem from something, from an experience or from somebody saying something to them rather than it just being an innate feeling. So I think that they should question their feelings uh, and their experiences. And also, same with doctors, they should question people's experiences and feelings rather than just affirming. I guess, like, also, I think something that's really not um, taught in schools is kind of, like, distress and, like, emotional regulation, where it's, like, just sitting with uncomfortable feelings. It's, like... I always had like a feeling that there was like, it was like my skin was on fire. And like when people looked at me, it just like, it was really unsettling. Like I hate, and now it's, um, it hasn't gone easier, but it's still like, I just exist with that kind of feeling of like, oh man, if I could take my skin off and just be like a skeleton, that might be nice, but you know, um, I, yeah, the second one's so, like, <laughs> such a robust kind of response. It's kind of hard to answer. Now, Mel, I know you've got something you wanted to read out. Um, I was wondering if you'd like to come up and read out, read out from up here or down there. Um, the lectern is all yours, and this will close us out for the evening. Let's make this right height, not popping. All right. Um, a lot of things have been... Sorry, I gotta pull it up first. Um, 
a lot of things kind of have been brought up this evening, but there's some, um, I kind of have like a philosophical kind of like, um, like down the track, like what is the um, implication of some of the things that are being implemented in schools, in society and such, struggling to unlock my phone. Um, uh, this is something I haven't really heard mentioned, so I kind of just wanted to throw it out there, leave it with you, and it's kind of it's kind of dark, but uh, this is what you signed up for, mate. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> um, so currently, there is currently a culture within schools that encourages keeping things from the adults within that child's life. This is, in my opinion, it's a great opinion. You should. <laughs> um, this is creating a dangerous precedent. When you have an environment where the culture is, don't tell your parents what goes on here, otherwise you could out someone, or implying their parents wouldn't understand because they're ignorant or bigoted, this is corrosive. It plants the seed that there are good secrets to keep from your parents. Here's the thought experiment. If children are taught that some penises are special and normal rules don't apply to them, telling them such things as penises are feminine and not masculine, or women can have penises, this poses a real risk to child safety. Once these new facts have been instilled into a child by a trusted, trusted adult, how difficult will it be to teach a child that a particular man's penis is different, that it's special and normal rules don't apply, so it's okay for the child to touch it? If a preschooler is taught being a boy or girl can change depending on how you feel, they could easily be convinced that it applies to adults and children too. I can picture it clearly, a man saying, yeah, I'm much older than you, but I feel like a kid, so it's fine if we hang out. This dilution of reality and accurate terminology can lead to a child being groomed. How exactly does a child communicate they were sexually abused if they can't accurately describe their experience? If a child goes to their parents and say, she made me touch her penis, do you think most people would understand or they would dismiss it, thinking it was imaginary? I want people to really I want people to really think about the outcomes, the possible outcomes we face if we can continue down this path and don't consider our approach, current approach. Thank you. Brent, you can't think of the bed. That's okay. As dangerous as it is in the state of Victoria, I think truth is anti-trauma and I want to thank Jay, Mel, Jill and Peter for the great efforts you've made to prepare and come and attend tonight and throw to David for some closing remarks. Um. You've seen a lot of courageous people tonight, and firstly, I'd like to thank um, May for uh, agreeing to uh, host this and MC. So please give a round of applause to Mike. And we. And I'd also like to thank all of the people who came, um, interested parties, families, uh, members of parliament, uh, uh, experts, and of course, especially Mel and Jay for uh, sharing their stories with us. Um, uh, it it puts into context what we're talking about when you know we're talking about things uh, as MPs we talk about things at a legal level or uh, medical experts talk about it at a professional level but I think it's really important to listen to the voices of people who've undergone these sorts of things and hear what they have to say and so thank you so much for sharing with us. There will, there will be a little bit of time here for um, uh, 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 hanging around and talking and having a sandwich and drink. But um, when you leave, you will need to be escorted out of the building by a pass holder. Uh, you won't be able to just walk out yourself. Um, so someone wearing one of these, if they're not an MP, uh, you need their, their help. Um, but one of the things that many people spoke about tonight, and I know that um, if you've had if you've been thinking about this and educated yourself about what's happening here, I think uh, the one thing that um, many of us are pushing for, and indeed even people who 
support the, the status quo should be pushing for is to have some sort of independent inquiry into gender medicine for children. Thank you.